praying, Jesus said, I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that they may be all as one. As you, Father, are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given them, so that we may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become completely one, so that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I desire that those also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory which you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Righteous Father, the world does not know you, but I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made your name known to them, and I will make it known, so that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. Brothers and sisters in Christ, grace, peace, and mercy to you from Jesus Christ, our risen Lord and Savior. Jesus prays, as you, Father, are in me, and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The world believes in Christ when they see him through us. It is Jesus' prayer that God in Christ will be known to the world by our actions and love, and that we will be one, one with him and one in community with each other. When I hear Jesus' prayer, it makes me believe that this should also be our prayer. This prayer comes as Jesus is in his final days. He is with his disciples for the last time before he is to be crucified, and he is praying for them. It's a powerful moment. One, one of the amazing things about this passage is that Jesus doesn't do this only for them but also for us. As Jesus prays, I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word. And that includes us. Jesus gathers his disciples. He is praying for them, and he prays for us. We are just the latest in a long line of persons who have been inspired and encouraged to believe and to pray because of the words and the lives of those disciples who have gone before us. It's interesting that even as Jesus was approaching certain death and was trying to prepare his disciples, he continued to show them how to pray, and he assured them that he continued to pray for them. You might think that with all the praying that happens in the Bible, all of the times that Jesus prays and the disciples pray, there's a lot of prayer that happens in the Bible. You might think that people would know how to pray, that we would know how to pray. Yet it seems that we all feel inadequate when it comes to our own prayer life, Certainly, when you are asked to pray in front of somebody else. I am sure that if I said, who would like to do our closing prayer here today, there would not be a slew of hands going up quickly and offering that gift. Just this past week, on Tuesday morning, I had a video conference call with about 10 other pastors and deacons. The assistant to the bishop asked for someone to open us in prayer, and it was crickets. Not one volunteered, and the assistant to the bishop was not giving in. He was, he was going to hold his ground and not do it for us. So we sat there for a minute, and finally, one of the pastors from El Paso said, all right, I'll pray. <laughs> I'm not sure what it is that makes us feel inadequate in our prayer. But I am certain that God is pleased when we pray, no matter the time or the place or the words or the silence that comes in that prayer. In confirmation interviews, which have happened in the first couple weeks of May, one of the questions that we ask them is about their prayer life. 
They almost always feel as though they're lacking in that area. And it is a little bit of an intimidating question, right? To ask a 14 or 15 year old, a freshman in high school, who is flanked by their parents at a table and sitting across from two of their pastors, so tell me about your prayer life, right? I'm sure that is also a conversation that most of you would not want to have with me right now. So tell me, how is your prayer life these days? It's kind of intimidating, and they often are timid and meek in their answer and lament a little bit, well, it's not very good, or it's not what it should be. And I had Pastor Travis there this year, and he helped to turn this question around a little bit, for which I was thankful. And when they would lament that they did not have an adequate prayer life, he would ask them, well, tell me then, what does an adequate prayer life look like? And I thought, well, that's a good question. What does an adequate prayer life look like? What does it mean to be successful in our prayer life or fully developed in when we pray? I'm not sure there is a real measure for having an adequate prayer life, but I am sure that being intentional in our prayer, in our relationship with Christ, continuing to grow in our faith, but in whatever way that means for us, coming to church, praying, reading the scriptures, in relationship with others, those all seem like good places to start. Jesus, of course, talks quite a bit about prayer in the scripture, in the gospel readings. He tells us that we should not be boastful in our prayer. The story of we shall not stand on the corner and wave our arms and preach in that way, but we shall go to our rooms and we shall preach on our own in quiet relationship with God. He teaches the disciples and us to pray with the prayer that we call the Lord's Prayer. And in the text today, Jesus preaches for, prays for us. And he says to us, the world does not know you, but I know you. And these know that you have sent me. I made your name known to them, and I will make it known so that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. We pray to know God. We pray so the world may know God through us, through our love and through our actions. Jesus' prayer in the gospel circles around connectedness, which feels like it should be familiar to us in this modern, connected, internet-driven world. We are never more than a text away from somebody else. You can go online and find just about any resource that you want. In my house, we ask Google for things all the time. Maybe you talk to Alexa. Right? It seems that we live in this world that is so connected. Yet a Harvard study and a study from the British Red Cross show that people feel more isolated now than ever. Loneliness is going viral. If that were a disease, it would be an epidemic. This is where we answer our call to discipleship. We share our faith, and in doing that, we grow our church community so that Jesus remains the image of what a connected community looks like, that connected community that we long for, yet we still seem to find so elusive. When our confirmands begin their two-year confirmation program, one of the first handouts that I give them is about understanding what confirmation is. There are four points in it, and one of them is relationship, because I believe that confirmation is about developing relationships with each other and with God. It's important for them to develop fellowship and relationships here in church so they know that they have a place to be safe. They know that they have a community that they can turn to and come to when they need to escape the epidemic of loneliness. It's my hope that they support one another, sometimes in quiet and unsuspecting ways, and always in faith and in prayer. 
I think prayer has an awful lot to do with relationships and not just with outcomes. So often we pray with an intended and expected outcome. We pray because it's a vital way of remaining in relationship. We may pour out our hearts to a friend or a confidant or a coworker or a family member, and in doing so, it's not with the expectation that they are going to do something about it. It's because we need somebody to share with. And as we share all these things, our relationship becomes stronger. That makes sense in terms of prayer as well. As we pour out our souls and share our deepest longings with God, the relationship becomes stronger. Walt Wangren, a Lutheran pastor and author, tells us that whole prayer is a circle, that it's closed and complete. We pour out our hearts and minds to God and he listens as we do. And then we listen intently for his voice when he speaks. Our relationship with God is an infinite circle of prayer and listening and then seeking and listening again. We are bound in that relationship of faith and in oneness to the Father in that circle of prayer. We are sent forth because of that love and in our baptism as the disciples were also sent. And it's in our yearning to be united and connected to God that gathers us together around this table of grace where we experience Jesus given for us each week. Our sacraments offer an experience to us that is powerful over and again in our relationship to God and to each other. Today our confirmands will come forward to affirm their faith and promise again to live into the baptismal promises that have already been made for them. And we will join them in affirming those promises and be reminded of the gift that we receive in Jesus Christ. It's a powerful moment in the life of the church when we can share in those sacraments. It's a powerful moment when we pray with each other and for each other. In our gospel reading, Jesus' disciples were there to hear him pray for them. They sat with him that night before he would be crucified, and he prayed for them, and he prayed for us. What a powerful moment it had to be to hear their Messiah praying for them. Pure gift. As I've thought on this passage during the last week, it gave me pause to reflect on some of the most meaningful times of prayer in my own life, and I should say, I wasn't thinking in terms of my praying for others, which in and of itself is a holy encounter each time. But I was thinking of the times when others have prayed for me. Each was a time of vulnerability, a time of need, some known, some unknown, and some a time of affirmation. But each a moment when someone else stopped and prayed for me. And in each of those moments was the presence of God through the gift of the Spirit as someone else took the time and had the words and had the silence to pray for me. In the past couple of weeks, I've had the opportunity as well to pray for each of our confirmands at the end of our interviews together. And I always hope that it is meaningful that the kids and their parents know how much we care for them and that we appreciate the trust that they have in us, the church, to walk with them in their faith. And just earlier this week, I had my staff review. Prayer certainly required. <laughs> but when we finished that conversation, Pastor Travis prayed for me for my life in this congregation, for care of me in this ministry. And it is humbling and it is moving when someone intercedes on your behalf. It's one of the greatest gifts in this vocation to pray for others and to be prayed for. To be prayed for by another is to know that one's life is cared for and has value to the one praying on your behalf. 
To be prayed for is to be vulnerable and dependent and deeply loved. It's a powerful and holy moment given to us by the Holy Spirit. If you've never had the opportunity to either pray for someone or to have someone pray for you, don't be afraid of that moment. You have it every single day. Take the opportunity to pray for those you love for, maybe to pray for those you love but don't like very much. Take the opportunity to offer your prayer for those around you. I remember the first time, it probably wasn't the first time, it's the first time that I remember and have carried it with me that someone prayed for me. It was Bishop Bjornberg, and it was at a synod youth gathering, and we were all doing prayer stations, and I was up front waiting for youth to come so I could pray for them, and he looked over and motioned me over to him, and when the bishop, you know, does this, you go. And so I went over, and he just placed his hands on me, and he prayed. And he prayed for me and my ministry. He prayed for Emmy. He prayed for things that I didn't know that I needed to be prayed for. What a gift it was, and one that will stay with me. And every time I have that opportunity to pray for someone, or for someone to pray for me, it's a holy moment, sacred space, and one that I hope you take the opportunity to do. So for each of you, and for our confirmands today who will come to affirm their faith, I'll offer you this. Jesus' confidence in the disciples is remarkable. His confidence in you and me is remarkable. He knows that it will be through their witness and their words that others, like you and like me, will come to believe in Jesus and as a believer, Jesus still prays to the Father for us and for our relationship with God. Jesus prays for you. Jesus prays for you. He prays for us, for our relationship with God. And so as we continue in our journey of faith, we may go with confidence knowing that our Savior has prayer for you. What might you need Jesus to pray for when it comes to your faith? Be assured that in those times when you don't know, Jesus does. And perhaps that changes how we pray, at least for the time being that instead of particularity in our prayer, including specific needs and certain wants, maybe we pray to Jesus asking, Jesus, pray for my belief today. I suspect many of our prayers are quite more detailed than Jesus or God need. I wonder what would happen if we were to simply pray, Jesus, pray for what you think I need. And we trust Jesus to take it from there. Jesus, pray for what you think I need. Jesus prays for us. In holy baptism, we become believers in God. We have our robes washed in the flood of Christ's forgiveness, and we receive the gift of life forever with all the saints. And for this, we say thanks be to God. And here, my friends, is the good news. Jesus prays for you. And for the communities in which we find ourselves, Jesus prays for you and for the community. And whether your cup is empty or full, whether your community is in crisis or experiencing joy, whether your future is foggy or clear, Jesus loves you deeply. And your life is bound to the God who loved you before even the foundations of the world. And on the eve of his death, Jesus entrusted your life and the church's life and its entire future to the Father, and what glorious good news that the future rests in the care of a triune God who prays for you. And that we, the church, are set free to make God known to the world in our love, in our actions, and in our prayer for each other. Jesus prays for you. Thanks be to God and amen.